What does the word gameness to a T mean to you? It is a, an animal. It, it can be a human being, actually. Even faced with death will not stop its effort, the effort, to dominate the opponent. Okay. No matter, even in the face of death, will not stop in its effort to dominate its opponent. And I say it, I refer to dogs, but it can also be humans too. Mm -hmm. But it's very rare in animals, very rare in animals. In fact, there's only, that I know of, only really two that have been bred. And, and we'll get into, this is a very important part. Gameness is a trait that has been bred into and I think we talked about this a little bit mm -hmm. that has been by breeding only bred into the, the animal. And, and I, in this case, we're talking about dogs because there's no other line of dogs that have been bred what we call, what I use the term against nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you're talking about nature, like a lion in Africa, or a leopard in South America, or or uh, a wolf in in Alaska. Those are apex. Those are the type one predators. Okay, mm. but they are not game. They will not stay in the face of death. Uh, they will not fight for the carcass that they they might have spent their whole everything trying to kill a deer or, or, you know, whatever they've caught. And if, like, it's a lion in Africa, and he's just gotten a wildebeest, and he's down there laying on top of it, eating it, and half a dozen hyenas come in on him, he's running away. He's not going to fight. Mm -hmm. He's not. Because if he, it's, it's innate in his, in his uh, DNA. It's the survive it, and it can't survive if it gets wounded because if, if the lion gets wounded he can, can't hunt anymore, he can't catch so then he's just going to die anyway so they don't, the, no animal in the wild is game there's no animal that's game in the wild mm -hmm. the only game animals that I know of are the, the uh, fighting cocks, fighting roosters and American pit bull terriers and they are only gay because they've been bred to be that way so they've been bred against nature if you understand what I what I just said um, yeah it, by selectively uh, weeding out the dogs that will quit you found one out of a litter or you found three out of a litter or you found none out of a litter you continue to cull your your uh, your herd, so to speak, until you get the ones that you know are the game ones. So having been bred against nature, they'll stay no matter what. They'll stay because you've looked at them, you've checked them, you've pushed them. See, gameness is a recessive gene, too. It, it runs, it goes, it goes away. Um, it's naturally hard to hold on to because it's against nature. You're actually breeding against nature. And nature's hand will have its way. Nature's hand will get in there. And in nature, a dog, maybe he'll go for a while. You know, he'll go hard for a while. But when it gets down to the nuts and bolts of it, you know, way deep into it, they just figure, hey, it's not worth dying for. Mm -hmm. And they'll stop. They'll quit. So that's what game is. I mean, I guess I've answered two questions. One is what is gameness? Mm. And the other is how you get there. How you, well, I mean, what, what a pit bull is and how they've gotten to be that way. Mm -hmm. Selective breeding has done that. It's selective breeding. It's, that's the, the primary thing that separates American pit bull terriers from all other dogs. Because no other dog is bred to be game. Mm. You know, they'll retriever will retrieve. Mm -hmm. a, re, a, a pointer will point. Um, 
a setter will retrieve. I, I mean, you know, there's a deer dog will run night and day until they, you know, wear themselves out. But they they won't do it till they're dead. Right. You know. So for the people who don't know, what is the definition of a cur? <laughs> uh, one that'll quit. And, you know, in the face of a battle, you know, if they're in, while in a battle, we'll quit on top. In other words, quit while he's ahead. Mm -hmm. We'll quit when they get behind. We'll quit after the hour. We'll quit in five minutes. There's a lot of curves, a lot of different levels of curve. Some will quit easy. Some will quit. Some up. Some of them are not easy quitters. Some of them are have a, a, a thin layer of veneer of of gameness in there because they'll go an hour and a half, you know, and not quit. But then at the hour ninety minute mark, they quit. But see, there's where you get into this levels of gameness, which I mean, and, and I'm part of the, the crowd that believes it. The old dog, you know, when you, after the fact and everybody's standing around talking about what just happened, you step up there and say, well, the old dog gave it all he had. Mm -hmm. Even though he quit, even though he quit, he did give it all he had. Because you can't blame the dog for not being game. It's it's the genes. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the it's not the breeder necessarily. The breeder, it is the breeder, but mostly it's the handler and the conditioner checking their dog and not making sure that it's game before they take it. Because a lot of the, today gameness is not as important as it used to be in from say 1950 up to say early 2000s. Right. Af after the early 2000s gameness ceased to be as important as ability and hard mouth, hard bite. Um, but without gameness, they won't stay long enough to bite anything. So right. you have to have, but they're not as game as they used to be, I don't believe. I mean, there's still a, a, a great deal of dogs out there that are very game, very game. But what happens in this business is a breeder will breed a dog. And what happens is the dog gets a particular set of those traits that the breeder is looking for. So the breeder is looking for talent. He's looking for ability. He's looking for hard mouth and he's looking for gayness. Those are say four different traits that the breeder is trying to achieve. Mm. Happens is as the cards get dealt, so to speak, the old puppies, they wind up getting one of those traits or maybe two of those traits and sometimes none of those traits. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of times, often what you'll see is a dog that bites real hard. Well, what I'm suspect right away when they do that is that he got all the traits of the biting the, it's a good thing, but he's gotten he, because he lo nature loaded up its its uh, what do you call? I, I'm not even sure what the term would be. Nature gave that dog all the bite and none of the other traits that the breeder was looking for. Does that make sense? Yeah. So <clears throat> nature, nature, nature took away or didn't take away anything. Just gave that puppy uh, a lot of bite and none of the other traits. And then on the other hand, another dog out of the same litter is so game, he wouldn't quit if you shot him in the head with a bullet. But the problem with him is that he's so game, he's got none of the other traits. He's got no ability, no talent, and no bite. But he, he would take his death and he, you, you'd never stop him. He would never quit.
but he's really not worth anything to you because all of his traits went into his gayness and all the other traits didn't get uh, manifest. When I see a dog and he's bite is incredible. And uh, keep in mind that we're talking hogs here. Okay. We're talking yeah. hog hunting. He bites so hard. I would be afraid of that dog until I knew if he was game or not. Because what I'm thinking is just out of experience only, and I might be wrong, mm-hmm. but, but based on my experience, when I see a dog that can bite that hard right from the get go, I'm going to go, okay, what else is he lacking? If he's got that much bite, he probably doesn't have a whole lot of anything else. And by the same token, he might have all that gameness and nothing else. And I've seen that. It's very common. It's more common than not to get one that has all four of the traits. Mm. And, And I should add a fifth one, and that is intelligence. How smart is the dog? Is he smart enough to get himself out of trouble? Is he smart enough to stay out of trouble? Because you might have a dog that's so offensive that he doesn't know how to do any defending. He doesn't know how to defend himself. He's Mm -hmm. pure offensive, and he leaves himself open. You know, a hard offensive fighter, it leaves himself open for, for, uh, for trouble, you know. It's like a football. Team, you know, a good football team, you know, they got a great quarterback, but they got no defense. And so they do good. They score good. But when it comes to defense, the the other team just rolls over them. So they leave themselves open, you see. So and in the same token with dogs, you, know, you get one trade or the other. Maybe you get a lot of ability and no gainness and no bite. And that's fine. Sometimes you can win with just one one of those things. You know, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've been on coon hunts at night where dog got separated. I lost the dog. Couldn't find him all night long. Walked all night. Called and called and called. Had a, a collar on him, but he slipped the collar. The collar got off. Mm-hmm. So I stayed in the woods all night walking and walking. And finally, <sighs> here he come running up to me. And when he came up to me, he was worn out, but he turned around and ran away, right away. He, he came up to me, he jumped up on me, and he, he was like barking, and then he turned around and ran. And then, so I followed him. Mm. And uh, he had gotten up on a, a whole den full of coyotes. And the hole wasn't much bigger than a coon, raccoon hole, you know. Wow. And it was into the side of a, a small hill, like a little hill that went up. And it was a den. It was a rack, it was a coyote den. <laughs> and when I got there, he had had, there was like two rack, uh, two coyotes that were dead. And another that had trying to still be alive. And he had, he was killing it as I came up to him. And when I got through getting him off that one and he killed three, he was trying to get back in the hole to get another. <laughs> <laughs> That's a game dog. That's a game dog. Uh, they, you know, they, they just, there's no stop. There's no quitting. It's a, it's a rare trait, especially today. Because a lot of your competitors today are, they're less interested in gameness as opposed to the old time breeders, like say, men like, I love Ed Crenshaw. It's one of the great ones. Um, and uh, Bob Wallace and uh, Frank Fitzwater and uh, Jerome Hernandez. Of course, you got to throw Maurice Carver and Floyd Boudreaux in that mix. Mm-hmm. And then coming into the newer group, the younger guys, like Indian Sonny and Bert Sarles and Pat Patrick and uh, mm-hmm. oh, there's some great ones. But they they bred more interested in being game than any of the other traits. And they would hope. So they were breed for gameness and expect to get at least one that had it all. You know, and it, nobody has a yard full of dogs that have it all. 
nobody. And they might tell you that they do, but they don't. Mm. Uh, more than likely, they've got a whole yard full of curs. They can bite real hard, but can't do nothing else. Right. Or got a whole yard full of game dogs. They're game, but couldn't bust a grape, you know. Right. And uh, to get to get a dog that has the, the, the talent, the ability, the bite, and the game that's with intelligent, smart, you know, smart dogs. Uh, in other words, I, I should use the term defense, have defensive abilities, because when you got talent, that means you've got ability and you're using that ability uh, as a good bulldog would uh, to out, out maneuver, out flank, out, out perform your opponent. Uh, in this case, we're talking about hogs or coyotes or whatever the dog gets on. Now, some people throw the terms, you know, American pit bull terrier and bulldog around. If a dog isn't game, do you even consider it an American pit bull terrier? Not a game dog. He's not a bulldog. Okay, let me clarify that. The old timers used to say, okay, nobody was going with their dogs on a hog hunt with dogs that weren't American pit bull terriers. They weren't nobody bringing German shepherds or Doberman pinchers or Rottweilers or Great Danes or, you know, whatever you want to talk about that are badasses. And there's plenty of good dogs that are pretty rough dogs, but there are none of them are in the American Pit Bull Terrier category. Mm. Okay, so those old timers were bringing American Pit Bull Terriers, so nobody denied or nobody would suggest that they're not American Pit Bull Terriers. That's what they were. That's what they are. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to one breeder talking to another or one dog man talking to another, he would say either he's a cur because he's a quitter or he's a real bulldog. And that's a slang term. He's a bulldog. Mm -hmm. And it's not an English smash face stupid looking dumb shit big fat bulldog. <laughs> right. not not that if the term from the old dog man came well he's a bulldog or he's a cur he's either a bulldog or he's a cur they don't say he's an american pit bull terrier they don't say that everybody knows that that's what they are they're american pit bull terriers but if he's a cur he's a cur he's not a bulldog okay. if he's a if he's a game dog it can take a licking then he's a bulldog. I mean, when I first got in the game, there was no such thing as bully breeds. Right. When I first got in the game, I mean, there weren't there weren't anything like that. I mean, they just they didn't exist. Um, nobody knew anything about that sort of thing. But I mean, you know, I don't have any problem with people having those dogs. They're great. I I know, I know they've got great personalities and they're very sweet they're great family pets and they're i love to look at them they're so cool they got great like i say they got great personalities and they're great family pets and they're super they're clown like they're really happy go lucky happy dogs they're always wanting to play and yeah. and they they're on the couch they want to be on the couch and that's what they that's where they belong they're not performance type dogs right what is your take on the american bulldog the big white dogs yeah yeah, um, yeah, they're a pretty gritty ga dog, um, and I wouldn't say that at least one out of maybe, and I'm just guessing on this, maybe one out of a hundred that would be game, that might be game. Mm. Um, they're pretty gritty dogs. They're pretty, I mean, my experience with American Bulldog goes back to the 80s, mm. and in the 80s, they were pretty tough dogs. I mean, they were really, because they, they had the ability, they had talent, they were big, and they were very aggressive and, and pretty game. They ran fairly game. I wouldn't say deep game, but I would say that they were definitely pretty game. 
uh, but now today, I couldn't speak to them today because I don't know enough about them. I, I have lost contact with anybody that might. I, I really don't know that much about them anymore. I got gotcha. you. But in the 80s, they were pretty gritty dogs. And uh, I don't know what happened to them if they got domesticated, kind of like the, uh, the golden retrievers. You know, back in the 50s, a golden retriever, man, oh, man, you had a duck dog. Those dogs were amazing. I mean, they would swim all day, all night, and they would retrieve ducks. I don't care how cold it was. I don't care how bad the weather it was. All they want to do is swim back there and get a, get another duck and bring it back. And that's what they did. Um, but today, you couldn't find one in a hundred that would, that would even think about doing that. They're just, they're all, people domesticated them. They make great pets, and they're very sweet dogs. Uh, they're family-oriented dogs, but they've been domesticated so much. Um, so many breeds have, have had that happen, they, and it's happening also to the American Pit Bull Terrier. Um, people love a dog. Wow, man, I want a fighting dog. Mm. But they would never fight it. They wouldn't even dream. They wouldn't even think of ever doing something like that with a dog. Mm. But you can't deny the fact that that's what they were bred to do. Mm. I mean, it's like sticking your head in the sand doesn't make it go away. Right. You can't deny what the animal was. The, the, the old uh, white, we used to call them white English bulldogs. Mm. And then they got the proper term American bulldogs. They're pretty stout dogs. They really were. And you would find every now and then you'd find one. Man, they were hell on wheels. They'd kill hogs. and Man, they wouldn't just stop a catch a hog. They'd kill a hog. I mean, they were 100 pounds of pure intensity. Now, I never really got into them because they were a little bit big for my liking. I like a dog you can handle, you know, snatch, you know, grab. And, and hold on to it. I mean, not that you can't hold on to an American Bulldog. You can, but it's hard to handle them, you know. They're so right. big. They're so huge. They, they were running at average 90 to 100 pounds, I think. Yeah, something like that. But I'm not sure what's happened to them in the last, say, 25 years. I couldn't really speak to it. I don't I think know. It's a, I think it's kind of a, a, a two-way street. I think there's some people that are – you know, still running them in the backwoods, and then there's some people that are um, trying to turn them into more of a show dog. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, that sounds like that's what it's happening with all breeds. It's, it's happened with, you know, the great German Shepherd, which is the greatest guard dog of all time, probably. Mm. Hey, there, there's a, you can't find one, anybody in the United States that's breeding them. You got to go to East Europe. Yeah. To get the real to German the best shepherd. ones, yeah. Yeah, if you want to get the best German Shepherds, you got to go to Eastern Europe. Like, so when you're getting a dog ready, when you're grooming a dog, and you want him to be able to to take on a hog, or uh, whatever you want him to do, yeah, what what goes into that? Like, how do you how do you selecting a dog is starting from say six months old, and it, and what I do is I imprint the dog on whatever I want it, it something wild, okay. Whether it be a raccoon, and, and I, what I do is I have these live traps. I have live traps, and I catch something. Like say, a, I catch a, a coyote, or I'll catch a raccoon, or I'll catch an armadillo. Now, if it's a raccoon or a coyote, I don't let the dog get it because I just don't want the dog to hurt the animal. I don't want the animal hurt. But I let the dog come up to the trap and smell it and know what it is, and he's only six months old. I let the raccoon go or the coyote go, and when he gets a lot, enough of a lead that I know the pup can't get up to it, catch it, then I'll let the pup go. And he'll chase it until the, the raccoon either goes up a tree or the coyote gets away. Mm. If it's an armadillo now, I'll just let him go and catch it. I'll let him catch it. Uh, with squirrels, when they're young, I don't let them catch it. I let them chase it, but I let the squirrel get enough of a lead to where it gets away. So in other words, there are trees around where the squirrel gets up a tree. But then the dog sees the squirrel go up the tree, and he knows what it is. So now the dog is imprinted on squirrels or raccoons, coyotes, armadillos, and small game like that. And that's what I 
been doing for the last you know, a lot of years. Um, and I, what I do selectively, and like you said, how do I select them? If they if they show a propensity to do that, you know, because some pups, you know, you bring them up to a, I don't know, maybe a squirrel in trap. I, they don't seem interested. And maybe they're young. Maybe they're too young. So then I'll come back two months, three months later when they get to be like, say, nine months old. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're starting to get more mature because some dogs mature slower than others. And uh, each time I bring it up, if it starts showing a a, a desire to to get it, to catch it, then I'll take it out in the open field and I'll let the squirrel go and get a long lead so the, the dog can't catch the squirrel. So the squirrel gets to a tree before the dog can get it. But he knows what it is. He knows what it's about. And he wants to catch it. And eventually, after doing that half a dozen times, I will actually let the dog get a chance to catch the squirrel. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he doesn't. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is that he he knows what it is. He wants to go for it. And he's going to push himself to get it as hard as he can. And so that's how I select the animal. And then what was the second part of your question? Well, the second part was more like, uh, how do you groom the animal? That would come under the heading of conditioning and getting a dog in shape for Mm -hmm. a hog or getting, because see, it's like 20, 30 years ago, these young guys, I mean, men that took their dogs hog hunting, they didn't really condition their dogs. They just, it was, it was just not, it wasn't a mistake. It was just ignorance. It's just young. It's men that want to hog hunt, but they were ignorant about being in shape. In other words, today we have so much knowledge about how much, how much you can enhance a dog's abilities by having the dog be in good shape. It's like we know so much about conditioning today. I mean, it's in every sporting event there is. And so we watch a sporting event. And before they show the main the main event, they show the people that are in the event how they got ready for the event and what they spend, you know, two hours a day jogging. They spend an hour a day hitting the bag. They spend another hour a day on the floor, you know, the grappling. Then they spend another hour a day wrestling. Then they spend, you know, X amount of hours, you know, getting rub downs and, and you know, just conditioning their body. Um, and so that's, it's not unlike that with a dog. If you're going to go on a hog hunt and you're going to subject the dog to possibly getting killed because the dog, the hogs, there's no dog. that's a match for a hog. I mean, really by and large hogs are bigger, stronger, and quicker than any dog. I mean, they're extremely quick, man. They move that snout so fast. I mean, they at, at the speed of light, they got your dog dead. And they got the big old spears, and two coming out of the top of their jaw and two coming out of the bottom of their jaw, and they cross each other, they're, and they're like hooks. They're like razors. Mm-hmm. And uh, the hog can move his snout from left to right, right to left, or uh, from down to up and up to down quicker than you can see it happen and the next thing you know he's good at your dog so why wouldn't you want to have your dog in good shape really top condition shape to withstand punishment because see conditioning doesn't only help you stay there it also helps you weather the storm it, it gives you enough in other words a person is going to get into a car wreck the person that's been building his body or his his or her body for X amount of years is more likely to come through the wreck with a less damage to their body than one that had never done anything but sit around watching TV and eating potato chips. Mm. Obviously. That's so, an interesting point. Um, dogs that are conditioned have the ability to withstand punishment much better. <laughs> And so it's it's only natural that you'd want to have machines, treadmills, carpet mills, slat mills, um, you know, uh, swimming pools, um, walk, you know, anything that would condition you work your dog. A weight training vest they put they they have nowadays. They get those vests 
you put around it. You can buy them. I don't, I don't have one myself. I don't use them, but they have a vest and it snaps around the dog, you know, around his shoulders and his back. And, and then you put him on the leash and make him walk for miles and miles or maybe jogging beside your bicycle or just put him up on your treadmill if you have a treadmill, which treadmill, I mean, that's really the simplest and best way to condition a dog is by treadmill. Let's put it this way. It's more convenient. Mm-hmm. Because if you go out on the road with a dog, you're subject to getting run over. Mm-hmm. You know, these trucks and tractor trailers and, and cars and, and vehicles are just, you know, they're running about their business and dog just steps out on the pavement there one time and blam, he's, he's meat. I mean, he's just crushed. He's like a, a grease spot in the road. But mm-hmm. So it only stands to reason after selection that you want to condition your dog before you take him to um, a really intense hog hunt or any kind of other hunt. You know, it would be because uh, here's the other part of that is like, so maybe you hunt, and you, you put your, you get in the woods, say, maybe two hours before dark and, and you walk your dog, say, you keep your catch dog on the leash. But you walk with him, you walk and walk and walk and walk. And finally, by one o'clock in the morning, you come up on something. You finally got, you, you know, you're on something. And then you got to walk another hour to, to finally get up to where it is, you know, because you finally cornered him or bait him up or pushed him so hard that the animal, whatever it is, is stopped and he's going to turn around and make a defense of it, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be a hog or a coyote or, or something, you know. So it, uh, it stands to reason that if you're going to walk and, and take that much, t- a lot of uh, energy, endurance, and then you expect the dog to do battle, you know, with a hog after walking six, eight hours. You know what I mean? Right. So it's, a, it's, it's wise. Uh, a man that loves his animals is going to have his animals in good shape before he turns them loose on something wild. Yeah, so it's only wise. It's just wise. And, and if you don't do it, it tells me you probably don't really love your dog that much. Mm-hmm. You don't care, right? Um, I want to make sure that mine are in good shape before I turn them loose on something, you know, whether raccoons or coyotes or whatever, hogs. So, How many dogs do you have now? Uh, I'm feeding about 10, 12. About, about 12. I got but, you. I have a lot of friends that have my blood. And so there's a lot of people out there feeding my bloodline that are very close friends of mine because I spread my dogs around so that I don't have all the burden of having to care for them, but yet I still have access to breeding and act activity with them. You follow me? Right. So that way you disperse a lot of the labor but I'm very selective about that too. Uh, you're not just going to come get one of my dogs until you prove me, prove to me who you really are. And I don't, I don't uh, easily let my dogs go. Now, if I don't know you and you just want to buy one, sure, I'll sell you a dog. Mm-hmm. But I still want to selectively uh, cut you out of the herd if I don't trust that you're going to do the right thing by the animal. Mm-hmm. If you're you're the wrong type of person if you have any, you know, I don't know, like say the dog is nothing more than just an object to get, you know, to satisfy your ego. Mm-hmm. I'm not likely to sell you a dog. I don't care what you want to pay me for it. Even if even if you want to give me more than I'm asking. And I've had people do that. But I'll turn them down in a minute. It's not about the money to me. It, I, I take a responsibility. That young pup comes up, I, will, I fall in love with every one of them, even the ones that aren't any good. <laughs> I still love them. Right. The ones that are, say, they don't make the grade, they're curs, they're not game, they don't have any ability, but they're just dogs. You know, they're just sweet old dogs, and they make a great family pet, and so that's, I'd like to try and place them in a nice family home, you know, so that. And they're not ever going to be expected to perform. They're just a pet, you know. So and I'm real particular about that sort of thing. Who gets my dogs? I want to kind of screen everybody that I talk to. Mm-hmm. So I prefer 
rather than a text. I'd rather talk to the person on the phone, get to know them right. uh, several times before they buy a dog from me. Mm-hmm. To my friends, the ones that are close to me, heck, I'll just about give the dog if, you know, we're going to work it together, work mm-hmm. the dog together, breed it together, condition it together, take it on a hog hunt together, you know. So. What would your advice be to the average family who wants an American Pit Bull Terrier? What, what would you tell them, like, as far as what precautions to take, as far as owning one, um, things like that? Well, there's really a good American Pit Bull Terrier. Um, a good American Pit Bull Terrier can make a, a good family pet as any other dog. So the only thing is you got to watch out for American Pit Bull Terriers is sometimes when they're some of if you're not if you're not encouraging that dog to do things, you know that are like to get you like hurt another you know get on another dog a neighborhood dog or you know kill the raccoons that are coming up in your garbage cans and you know you, you say you're discouraged behavior um not not punish behavior you know I, i'm not talking about punishing the dog for that but more discouraged behavior that you don't want um i american pit bull terriers are just as easily uh turn into a house pet as any dog but you do have to be wise you wouldn't just let the dog run loose in the neighborhood don't do that Mm -hmm. so if you have a fenced in yard let him out to go and let him play in the yard a little bit and then bring him back inside um rules of rules of the road would be um, teach him how to kennel up when you go to work. When you go to work, you say, got a nice size kennel and maybe the back, one of the boys' bedroom or the girls' bedroom or maybe a guest bedroom mm-hmm. or, or a guest, uh, uh, like maybe you got a little office space in your house, got the kennel in there, got a nice uh, pillow bedding, you know, fresh water, um, let the dog go out empty, come back in, kennel up you know put him in the kennel and then go to work and when you come home take him out of the kennel let him go out do his business come back in and and then you have rules and, and those are rules that are, if you go by those rules have a nice fenced in yard um have a have the dog where he's comfortable kenneling up um and abiding by those simple rules right there will keep you from having trouble with your neighborhood dogs and don't get me wrong, not every pit bull wants to kill the neighborhood dogs. I like to hog hunt. That's it. You know, and, and wild game. I love going wild game hunting. Um, typically today what I do is I sell a young pup. And if the guy or the girl or the people, the family that buys the dog wants to come back and imprint the dog on something wild, then they come back and I'll, we'll imprint the dog and show you how to take the dog in the field but it's going away too because yeah you gotta have land you gotta have 100 acres or so you know mm. and not everybody has 100 acres or 200 acres or have access to a place where you can let your dog run free and then go looking for you know raccoons at night uh, like on a friday night go raccoon hunting mm. and i grew up doing that stuff that's all that's all we did that's what we did for for our you know what you call recreation Mm-hmm. Go wreck with the dogs. I mean, we used to, we used American pit bull terriers. Um, I'm on coon hound trials, hey, coon dog trials with the pit bull. That's yeah. awesome. Sure have. And, and all the other dogs were bred for coons, and mine wasn't. But I won the coon hound trials. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I have noticed that American pit bull terriers can beat almost any dog at their own game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, put it this way. If you lined up the great athletes of the world, and and we have to say the NBA, in my opinion, the NBA players are probably the greatest athletes. Mm -hmm. But then you've got NFL players, you've got Major League Baseball players, you've got track athletes, which are getting way up there in talent. 
um, swimmers, um, golfers, um, tennis players, every athlete in the world. And then you take an MMA guy, a guy that fights in the UFC or, or any of the other competitive mixed martial arts arenas. Mm. That guy, that MMA guy, outperform all of them hands down. Yeah. All of them. There's none of them can stay with them. None of them. And, and I've always said, I've always believed that NBA players are probably the greatest athletes in the world, with the exception of the MMA fighters. They're the, they're the ultimate athlete because there's no contest in the world harder, tougher, more grueling, more demanding than a hand-to-hand combat. That's the most demanding sport in the world. I agree. No question about it. No doubt about it. They could, I mean, you know, NBA, they're, they're, they're dominating each other in a, you know, with a ball going through a ring, a, a ball going through a ring or a ball going through the uprights mm-hmm. or hitting the ball over a fence. You know, so, but you take the guy that has to, do hand-to-hand combat, literally, to dominate his opponent to win. There's no contest. There's no. So there, that is the answer to the equation you were talking about just a moment ago. That the pit bull can do anything any other dog can do, and then turn around at the end of it and whip the dog. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it can uh, perform in retrieving. The pit bull terror can re- perform in. And, uh, you know, running uh, raccoons or deer. Mm-hmm. The pit terrier can do anything within reason any other dog can do and then turn around and whip that dog. Yeah, so, 100%. They're, they're the ultimate dog. There is no question in my mind they are the ultimate dog. There's no dog. I don't care. You can breed them however you want to breed them. You can cross them. You can make them bigger. You can make them smaller. You can do whatever you want to do. You're not going to... Uh, produce an animal that's greater in ability and talent than the American pit bull terrier. They're, they, to me, in my opinion, they broke the mold when they made the American pit bull terrier, and it's the one reason because they're bred against nature. That's the only thing that sets pit bull terrier apart. American pit bull terrier is bred against nature, so therefore, they're bred different than any other animal being bred. So, have you ever seen um, a true pit bull terrier used in protection work? Sure, but keep in mind now. Here's what I believe about that. It, you ever hear of a guy named Gene England? No. Uh, he's five or six time world champion. Shuts him. Mm-hmm. He has a contract, or he used to have a contract training all the San Diego County, and that's from Los Angeles all the way down to the border of Mexico. A very, very big spot. Sheriff's Department dogs. Mm -hmm. Every Sheriff's Department in San Diego County. I mean, we're talking about a massive area. Every Sheriff's Deputy that that had canines, this guy was in charge of, had a contract to, to train their dogs. And I worked for the guy, but like I say, he was a five or six time world champion Schutzen, Schutzen uh, master. Mm-hmm. And he won it in, in Eastern Europe. But anyway, he told me years ago, he goes, yes, your pit bull terrier can make a great uh, security dog. You know, they make very good you know, uh, uh, dogs to, to, you know, whatever you call personal protection, uh, guard, um, bomb sniffing, drug sniffing, uh, whatever uh, tracking. The pit bull terriers are very good at it, but they're not as good as the Malinois at it. They're not as good as the German Shepherds, and they're not as good as the Doberman Pinschers. In other words, right? why would you use a pit bull terrier 
when you can when you're basically driving a Volkswagen. Right. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to having a Malinois, which you're driving a Rolls Royce. Mm. You know, and because the Pitbull Terrier has been bred to be sociable, very sociable within the handler and the people around it. They are not bred to be human aggressive. Mm -hmm. Malinois, German Shepherds, Dome Pictures have been bred through the hundreds of years to be human aggressive. Pitbull Terriers have not been bred to be human aggressive. Now, can they be human aggressive? Absolutely, they can, to the point of, uh, to a negative level, you know, dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because when they get, when they get turned on, it's hard to call one of those off. See, you can call a Malinois off by a verbal command. A lot of times, Pitbull Terrier, you can't give the verbal command and they won't come off. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're really not bred for that. They're bred for something different. They're catch dogs. They're not. They're not catching humans. They're for catching wild animals. You see. Mm. So, your better bred animals for that particular personal protection would be your Malinois or your German Shepherd, or you know the the right bred German Shepherd that is. Mm. So, and that's just the way I see it. And I'm believe me. I'm the first in the world to, to brag on whatever the pit bull terror can outperform every dog and everything and then whip it. And that's what topic we were just talked about, but they can't, they're not better at, they're not better at retrieving ducks than a, a dog that retrieves, that's been bred to retrieve ducks. They're as good as, mm. you know, they're, they're probably as good as a lot of these other animals that do what they do. But they're not necessarily better. But at the end, they can whip the dog. Now, that's for sure. Right. So, so a Malinois is just a personal protection dog. I mean, that's what they're bred for. Pit bulls are not bred for that. But they can be they can be re imprinted and and can be used for those things. Mm -hmm. And they made great. I think Lee Robinson's done tremendous work. You know, so they do probably better uh, protection and guard than a straight American pit bull terrier would do. Right. Yeah. Um, American pit bull terrier, like I say, I mean, they're bred to catch hogs or catch bulls or catch farm animals. You know, maybe a farm animal got away and it's creating a nuisance to the neighbor farmers. Mm -hmm. And so you turn your pit bull loose to go get it, you know, catch it and bring it down. Uh, something like that. So that's what pit bulls are for. Mm -hmm. And there, there's probably no other dog better at it than they are. But yeah. So that, yeah. I, can they be personal protection? Absolutely. And I, I think there's, quite a few police departments out there today that are using pit bull terriers. And they, yeah, I've, I've heard of one or two for sure. Um, seeing videos on the internet and whatnot. Yeah, they're out there. I mean, they're probably not as many, but they're out there. I mean, definitely. I think uh, the, the ones I've seen, though, were more of your catch weight type uh, bigger. pit bulls. Yeah, the, the bigger dogs. Um, yeah. That's okay. Uh, for my last question, let me, let me ask you about that. Where do you think, as far as the ADVA pit bull terrier, the real deal, you know, the game dog, versus the UKC pit bull and the AKC AM staff, what are the major, now I, I pretty much get the big picture, but in your opinion, what are the major differences there? Okay, it's real simple, and we've kind of covered all that already. The uh, American Pit Bull Terrier, not exclusively now, mm -hmm. but dogs that have been bred from the ADBA Foundation, which was the original American Pit Bull Terrier coming from the two lines of the Dibo and the Colby. Colby and Dibo are the beginning of, of Pit Bull Terriers in this country. 
uh, it goes back to Leitner and Williams and stuff like that. But Colby, Colby, that's John P. Colby, and a dog named Dibo, Tudor's Dibo, is the foundation for all American pit bull terriers. Whereas those dogs have been bred for the pit for, you know, 100 years. Here, that's just in this country. Mm-hmm. All the pit bull terriers... The, all the lines in this country come straight from Colby and Dibo? No. The American Pit Bull Terriers that are registered by the American Dog Breeders Association, ADBA, the foundation of those, all those dogs come from two primary dogs, two primary different dogs. One is Tudor's Dibo, and the other is John P. Colby. He was a breeder. He imported dogs uh, at the turn of the eight, 1800, uh, 1800, 1880s, no, 1890s to the 1900s. Okay. Okay. And he imported dogs from Ireland. Uh, and then they came up after the war. Okay. And a dog named Dibo, Tudor's Dibo. And the other line was from John P. Colby. He was from Massachusetts. They made the connection between the Tudor's Dibo dog and the John P. Colby dogs. And that's the very foundation of the American Pit Bull Terrier today. Mm. And, and registered by the ADBA. Whereas the AKC and the UKC, back in, say, the 30s and 40s, they were bred from game dogs. Mm-hmm. Okay, but somewhere after that, say, assuming after the war, somewhere after the war, mm-hmm. when I say the war, World War II, somewhere past World War II, the AKC and the UKC were no longer registered, uh, were only registered in the Staffordshire, and they were getting away from breeding for gameness. Mm-hmm. And so they were breeding uh, mostly staff in there. And the staff was bred for its confirmation, not for its performance ability. So when you see UKC and AKC, you're not looking at American Pitbull Terrier. You're looking at Staffordshire Terriers. Mm. So even though the UKC still tries to label their dogs American Pitbull Terriers, you still refer to them as staffs? Oh, yeah. Okay. They are. Yeah, they're not. They're not by any stretch American Pitbull Terriers. They're not. They're bred for, they're bred, bred for confirmation. American pit bull terriers are bred for performance. That's the biggest difference right there. And the AKC and the UKC only recognize. They don't want American. They don't recognize ADBA, <laughs> whereas ADBA is the gold standard for American pit bull terriers. Mm. Not AKC and not the UKC. They, they're not. In fact, they, they don't even let. You know, whether you got those every year, you watch TV and they have that Westminster Kennel Club dog show. Oh, God, what a (laughs) joke. Oh, my God. It's so political. It's it's such a, oh, God. It's very very hoity-toity, that's for sure. Oh, my God. They've ruined it. They've they've ruined the breeds. All the breeds, they're, they're so domesticated. They don't do anything anymore. They just walk around. And they get groomed, and they use blow dryers, and I, I don't know. I just, I don't, <laughs> I'm not into it like that. But I want a dog that can perform. You know, that's it. So that's what I do. But no, the AKC and UKC, I wouldn't own a dog that had that. If he even, if it was even registered by AKC or UKC, and if it said UKC on there or AKC on there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't own the dog. Mm-hmm. Of course, you can't just bring me an American Pit Bull Terrier either. I ain't going to just take any dog. No way. You can't give me a dog. <laughs> There's no, you, can, you just can't walk out here and give me a dog. There's no way. I, I, don't, I don't do that. I just, I'm selective about what I take. But anyway. 